Welcome everyone. I'm Alison Jane Reed, the journalist founder of Ethical Headness, the organic culture magazine. So today I'm going to be in conversation with two inspirational founders, Sarah and Farah from Hanks, which is a disruptive sexual wellness company. Welcome Sarah and Farah. Thank you for having us. Hi. Hi. So, the thing about sex is sex is everywhere in advertising, in the media, but it, it doesn't mean that we're uh, any less hung up on actually talking about sexual health or sexual wellness. And um, I have a question for you, Sarah. Why do you, why do you think that is when it's, it's such a hot topic? It's being explored in many Netflix dramas right now, particularly with yeah. sex education, which is very frank and fearless. But that doesn't spill over into real life, does it? We're still very circumspect about talking about our, ourselves as sexual beings. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, it's definitely changing at the moment, like you say, in kind of popular culture, we're talking a little bit more about uh, positive sexual wellness and kind of holistic sexual well-being. But I think it stems back to, I mean, especially for, for kind of my generation and our generation, Farah, we, our sex ed at school was pretty rubbish. We didn't talk openly and honestly about, you know, relationships and pleasure and all of the things that come around uh, sex and sexual wellness. But I think it also comes down to kind of British culture being a little bit prudish around talking about sex and talking about the, the other aspects um, surrounding sexual wellness, not just the act of sex itself, but, you know, pregnancies, contraceptions, pleasure, uh, contraceptive choices, uh, pleasure, like we mentioned, um, relationships, all of those kind of things that kind of add up into to sexual wellness and, and even things like female health and uh, and uh, and men's health and and kind of sexuality and uh, all of those things I think we don't we haven't opened the discussion around them and even though, even it, it is everywhere you know in in our popular culture in drama in film we hear about sex scandals involving celebrities and politicians yeah. but when it when it comes to ourselves we don't seem to be able to to talk about it or to ask for help now, with Hanks, um, you know, you've set yourselves up as, as a disruptive, very female-focused company. You're making ethical, biodegradable condoms, lubricant, and you've just brought out a hormone harmony kit. What is your overall goal for Hanks? What have, what have you set out to do? So we're here to empower everyone to to take control of their sexual health and feel proud to do so. And ha by having a platform uh, that speaks openly and honestly about sexual health and everything that comes with it, I think, um, you know, our products speak for themselves, but also we have education, we have a forum, we have uh, opportunities for people to, to talk about these things that haven't been spoken about kind of um, without glossing over the realities of, of, of what, it, what it means to, to have sex and to have uh, positive sexual wellness. Have you, have you found that the forum on Hanks has actually opened up the discussion and debate around sexual wellness for women? Do they feel that they, they can use it as a safe haven to ask for help to treat, to treat you both as agony aunts? I mean, you're a gynaecologist and a, a women's doctor. Are women responding to that opportunity? I think the forum is really kind of just a safe base um, rather than kind of debating it's more just kind of saying you know I've had this issue as anyone else can anyone else relate to me and it can be anonymous obviously and it can be from yeah female health to to sexuality to relationships to anything um, you know we have lots of different topics on there and lots of kind of less common things that we don't really you know talk about in society or even you know through sex at school or through other brands so I think it's just a really safe space for people to to talk about things that they don't really feel comfortable talking to other people about and um, you know when I worked as a, a gynecology doctor there was a lot of people that actually would come into clinics and still feel embarrassed talking to myself who I'd be seeing and talking about it all day they'd still be you know really apprehensive about talking about their their sexual health so I don't think any woman enjoys actually going for a sexual health checkup or if 
we've got a problem. You know, it, it's something that most women would feel rather anxious about. Is that, have you learned from that experience in, in a way that you can feed into what you're doing with Hanks to reassure women and, and to empower them? Yeah, and again, I think it comes down to kind of being open about it and educating and saying, look, for example, if you go for a sexual health check, this is what happens. And, you know, empowering people to, you know, giving the education and giving the knowledge is, is really essential. Um, so saying this is what happens and you can, you can say no at any time, you can stop the examination, you can stop, you know, you can uh, disclose whatever you want to disclose. But ultimately, you know, by uh, talking to professionals and learning, you're empowering yourself and, and learning about your own body and kind of owning that, that whole journey. Can I, can I ask what the response has been to both you and Farah to, to Hanks? What, what was the response fairly instantaneous when you launched up, when you launched with your ethical condoms and your lubricant and your open attitude to sex and female empowerment? What was the initial response? I mean, I that, Farah? Yeah, so I think the, the category has been dominated for years and it's it's not been disrupted in the way that we've disrupted it so when we launched it was a bit of a behavior change obviously there were a lot of people who were all for it and super happy that there was a product out there that women would feel proud to buy and carry um but then there was a bit of pushback from men saying well it's a man's job and you know women are seen as promiscuous if they carry condoms so is that really still an issue in 2020 I'd hope not, but I think sadly that that attitude still exists with some people when that shouldn't be the case. Women shouldn't feel embarrassed to take control of their sexual health. You know, they should be proud to to take control of that and, and look after their health. Well, also, it's about um, being responsible for yourself, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And not being put in a position where if you're going to have sex with a, a new partner that you can say what you want and you're not prepared mm -hmm. to put your sexual health at risk mm -hmm. for example using condoms with a, with a new partner yeah I no doubt, doubt that in a, a lot of situations a woman is put in put in the awkward position of having to say i want a condom to be used to protect yeah. sexual health yeah and i, and I think it is interesting the confidence to say that's important to me and not being fobbed off yeah, and I, and I think that attitude is changing. I think with the rise of dating apps over the last few years, more and more people are having casual sex and the only thing that is going to protect you against SCIs is a condom, uh, not the pill. So with that, women need to feel more confident and in control and carrying condoms as part of their sexual health routine. Um, so I think the attitudes are changing. And I hope that Hanks and our branding, our tone of voice and what we're like with our community, i.e., we're real, we're relatable, we're not glossing over the realities of being a woman in the 21st century, but we're making, we're, you know, it's an open space and a safe space for women to come and talk and feel empowered about sexual wellness. It's so important to prevent the tragedy of unwanted pregnancy and to empower both men and women to, to act um, in a way where they can be responsible towards each other. Yeah. Is that something you would like you know, to be able to do with Hanks. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Sarah and I have always stood for equalism and, and that means fairness with, with both genders, you know, and I think that's really important, but I think in order to move the needle on on equalism, you need to have men as allies and they need, they need to be on board. And I mean, I was raised by two older brothers. So, uh, you know, our family is all about equalism despite any cultural or traditional barriers. Um, and I think that's just as important. It's not just about women burning their bras. It's about the men behind them, championing them um, and supporting that, that fight to equality. Can I, can I ask you, what was the reaction from your families when you um, announced that you were setting up a sexual wellness business? Do you want to go first? <laughs> wants to go first? Yeah, I mean... I'm, look, I'm very lucky. Like my parents were very supportive. It was quite a change from medicine to um, to condoms, but they kind of were a bit like, "Oh, what's you know, what's that all about? What are you doing?" But 
you know, when we started to explain to them what, um, and Farah's really close to my family as well, and they, they adore her, and we were around the table saying, you know, this is what we're going to do. And they're like, okay, <laughs> are they going crazy and just deciding this is like a blip, or is this actually what they're doing? Um, and they've been really supportive from, from day one, really. Um, I think maybe they thought it wasn't going to be um, what it is today, um, but they've, yeah, they've backed us. What about your friends and peers? What about fellow doctors? Your yeah, doctors? interesting. So what was their that, response? Yeah, I mean, well, in terms of doctor friends, I think doctors found it, it's quite, you know, uh, traditional for doctors to, to go through the, the uh, system in medicine and, and work your way up. And a lot of my senior doctors were saying, you know, we don't want to lose you within gynecology and, you know, why are you doing this? And didn't understand the bigger picture, really. Um, but my close friends in medicine were so supportive and they've championed the brand from, from day one as well. And Farah and I actually went to school together. So our school friends um, thought it was hilarious, I think, at first. And then, uh, but yeah, they, they've been great. Like we are surrounded by uh, a great group of, of, of friends. So um, I think it was a shock for a lot of people at first. But and now are they know. coming to you for advice? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And they love, you know, watching the brand grow and um, seeing what we, where we take it next. What about the challenges as women founders setting up a, an ethical wellness business? Perhaps, Farah, you could uh, talk, talk to me about this. What, what challenges did you face when you wanted to set up? Mm. Um, so I think definitely there's some challenges around investment raising, um, pitching for investment. Generally, the the large portion were men. And how did yeah, so how did they react to the fact that you wanted to make ethical biodegradable condoms? What was yeah. So, so I'm not slating men at all, but there there were a small handful that didn't understand the concept. They well, it's a man's job, or they thought that Sarah and I were just two little girls that just have this dream and it wasn't going to work you know the big dogs in the adult industry they they know what they're doing they can handle this this is just a bit of a dream for you and it's not going to last and then there were some people some many guys actually I remember this quite well I was pitching at an event in um, Jersey and uh, a bunch of investors who had made a lot of money and who retired angels and I pitched and one of the guys actually said can you can you show me how to put it on? And I was absolutely shocked that in this day and age, that sort of attitude still existed. And it was a man probably about my father's age. And I, it was just shameful. So how did you, you, know, how you handle that, Farah? I mean, that, that's a horrible position. Yeah, it was. It was what you can do is treat it with humor and give as good as you can. Yeah. It was relatively uncomfortable. Now, I think I remember saying to him, do you have daughters? And then I think a couple of people stood you know, backed me up and were like, you know, that's not on. Um, so we have had pushback from investors, certainly being female founders and them thinking, oh, well, you know, they're just two little girls. Then I think what really adds clout is Sarah's medical background, being a gynecology doctor, specialist in her field, speaking about women's health. Um, myself being a number cruncher at an investment bank, hopefully stands instead when they then look at our presentation and put it against both our career experiences. So um, that's definitely helped, but I still think not enough is being done around supporting female founders. Um, certainly from an investment standpoint, less than a penny of every pound of VC investment still only goes towards women. So 99p goes to male founders, which is just shocking. That's, 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 the UK a, sh then. that's a shocking statistic. Yeah. Yeah, so there's definitely a lot more that can be done and we certainly face challenges. But I have to say, of the investors we have, the uh, men and women, but speaking about the men, the ones that have, have come on board with Hanks have been super supportive, completely understand the vision um, and realise it's about equalism. And, and generally, those investors either have daughters, sisters, or, or very close bonds with the, the women in their lives. So, um, yeah, any investor that has been like that, we've known quite quickly they're not the ones for our, for our brand. Where did you find investment? I mean, did you did you have to think outside the box to find investment? Yeah, we definitely did. So we we would do a lot of networking, speak to speak to as many people as we could about our brand, because you never know who might know someone who might be interested in investing. Um, and we also looked at what our ideal investor would be. So Sarah and myself sat down and 
we we looked at what we'd want out of an investor beyond their capital so do they have expertise what what knowledge do they have that can impart and a good example actually is we uh the founder of pretty little thing adam kamani um i dm'd him on instagram and said you should diversify your portfolio and he he said tell me more and we sent our pitch deck over to his pa and we were pitching to him in manchester the following week um so there are definitely quirky, isn't it? How, quirky ways of how business is changing that you were able to reach out to somebody on mm. instagram now the story about about the inspiration for hanks is, is interesting too that you were having a conversation with a female colleague who had been embarrassed mm. cube buying condoms by mm. a boss could you tell tell us that story Farrah? <laughs> yeah that that person happened to be me <laughs> um, i wondered if it was you yeah. <laughs> you were trying to um yeah I, I, <laughs> uh yeah i was working in it happened because it, it's so relevant and and it's also surprising in 2020 but this is still happening yeah 100 years after women got the vote yeah it's i mean i so obviously i was working in banking at the time and there was a pharmacy a couple of doors down i had come off hormonal contraceptives because the side effects were just not suited to me such as weight gain mood swings um and i was popping out to get some lunch and picked up some condoms and my boss was behind me and he didn't say anything but I felt embarrassed and when I looked back I think why should why was I embarrassed why should I have been embarrassed like I'm an empowered woman but I did and I was embarrassed and I was worried about what he was thinking and that's the reality of it I was worried he was thinking who is she getting up to hanky panky with on her lunch break what's going on and uh doing later you know. yeah and you know we didn't exchange words it's fine I'm pretty sure he saw that red pack but I was feeling embarrassed and that embarrassment soon turned to frustration and and that's when I was telling Sarah about this experience um and Sarah was was backing this theory up with obviously women coming into their clinics with hard to treat SDIs or thinking that men were carrying condoms so that was sort of when that light bulb idea came about when we both had my experiences how long did it take you from that conversation to the launch of Hanks? So we, we launched towards the end of 2017. So a good 18 months to two years. Um, the condom is a medical device. So we have to undergo rigorous testing, um, MPD, product development. Um, so it did take us some time. Yeah. Now, um, one interesting statistic on your website is that your sales have gone up 117% during COVID-19, during the lockdown. Mm. Wow, obviously a certain sector of the population are having more sex, despite the idea that it would be a turn off for some people because of stress and anxiety and huge sort of collective uncertainty. Um, I'd like to bring you in, Sarah, at this point as mm -hmm. a doctor. Um, is sex good for us in the middle of a pandemic with all this angst and insecurity? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's very good for us and it helps with stress. It's good for our general physical and emotional um, well-being. However, I think to caveat that, I think there's a lot of people still out there that, you know, there's some people that the libido is great at the moment. They're quite, you know, they're locked down with their partner um, and it's all going really well and having more sex than normal. However, there's, an, uh, uh, there's another side to that. Um, and, uh, you know, we are stressed. We're in the middle of a pandemic. There's, you know, lots of other things going on and stress does reduce libido. So there's lots of people that actually that's the last thing on their mind or they might have a family and young children or living at home with the wider family. And actually it's not really... Uh, you know because yeah cooking and everybody's on top exactly. of each other so i think we have to consider both and actually we shouldn't pressurize everyone to be having the you know most amazing sex ever and regular you know all the time sex just because we have that opportunity if you're with your partner i think so there's, there's two sides to that some people are locked down or with their partner and they wouldn't normally be um so yeah there's, there's definitely two sides there but what are the health be benefits of having sex in terms of reducing, uh, reducing stress and also releasing endorphins? Yeah, 
exactly. So, I mean, I think uh, in terms of endorphins, yeah, feel good hormones are released during sex. We also have uh, lots of other hormones that um, kind of attach us to the partner and the kind of cuddle hormones that make us feel connected at the end of sex. Um, you know, we, we also increase our, our heart rate and blood flow around the body. It's, it's an active thing for most people. So, uh, you know, that's positive in terms of physical, you're, you're, you're forming a, a good bond with your, your partner. So there's, uh, there's lots of different kind of factors that um, are really positive about having sex in, in general. And as you mentioned, endorphins, they help with reducing stress and, and feeling good, especially when there's lots of scary stuff happening. Well, what do we know about human behavior during an extraordinary situation like COVID-19? You know, we, we haven't experienced um, this kind of uncertainty or threat to the way we live mm -hmm. for, for around 100 years. Exactly. The pandemic was approximately 100, 100 years ago. What do we know about human behavior, particularly in terms of sexuality? during a time like this? What, what, in what way do people generally behave? So right. the difficulty is that we have, yeah. we don't have that, sorry? We can't see, you know, it's a hidden threat, isn't it? Yeah. We can't see COVID-19. That's what makes it so frightening, I think. Absolutely, and I think there's there's been a few studies, but not lots of studies into this kind of thing. Like you say, it's, you know, just, happen often and um you know we haven't got enough data and enough kind of in-depth studies on this but we do know that as i mentioned stress does reduce libido um so there is kind of a, a, a parallels with you know during times of pandemics they do increase stress and therefore the, there may well be a, a link to reduce libido but there's also um the kind of huge opportunity of a baby boom a post corona baby boom as we kind of um have discussed before and and this has happened with other big kind of um environmental um health uh, pandemics in the past that there has been a peak in um babies born post uh, this kind of situation so um the question is will they balance each other out or will one then um overtake the other and there's just so many other factors to consider you know where we are in the world different cultures access to contraception um how we are being locked down as a society whether we are with partners um all of those kind of things so it's really interesting and i think after this is all settled down there will be a lot of um kind of in-depth analysis into into that kind of um you know behavior and and uh, impact well, and the research, we're seeing the number of pregnancies that start to surface as we come out of out of lockdown. Now, um, you have just just launched your new hormone harmony kit. Let Let's talk a bit about hormones. In fact, I've got all your goodies in my magical box, which I I um, use to put. Um, the mantras about whatever I'm working on or I want to achieve for, for ethical headness and, and one of them was launching this chat show so it's really exciting that this is uh, our first live edition of the chat show but it, it would be interesting to talk to you about how you put the kit together and what you what you were looking to achieve Sarah as a doctor because the whole idea is mind body wellness a complete hormone free approach if you can't get access to contraception right now, you're running out of the pill, or perhaps you've had a lot of side effects and taking the contraceptive pill. So could you talk me through how you, how you put the kit together and how the, the different supplements and vitamins and CBD will work in conjunction? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think, like you say, this is a holistic kit and by no means does it replace your your health professional but it's we're here to support people that perhaps have been thinking about coming off hormones for a while or like you say can't access contraception and thinking actually let's look at natural methods such as condoms to protect against um unwanted pregnancies and uh, when we when Farah and I and, and, and Charlotte and the team, we sat down and, and kind of looked at this kit. We thought, what what would you need? You know, if you're coming off hormones and your your body's 
getting into a more natural cycle, which can take a bit of time, um, what things would support that journey? Um, and we kind of got our little pink book of uh, wellness brands that we that we love and, and know and thought, let's get it together and make this kit. So for example, CBD oil, yes, they can, there's lots of benefits for, for many people around kind of alleviating pain and uh, and cramps. So we thought that's, that's great let's let's put what's also lowering lowering anxiety yeah exactly just from trying your cbd oil that it had exactly that effect i felt really, really good about that's really yeah. it definitely yeah. Was. yeah great and and so that's obviously got yeah helps in in many ways the the vital bit really of stylish condoms you know Thanks. the, the package yeah. is lovely yeah, I mean, you, you hopefully, we hope people are quite proud to have them on their bedside table or uh, wherever it's they keep their condoms. Um, and like you say, they're, they're natural, uh, vegan, biodegradable, um, and the, the water-based lubricant can be used with them. And it's, again, pH balanced, so it doesn't affect the, the natural flora of the vagina, so we're not more susceptible to things like thrush. Um, it's all lovely and in sync with your body. I don't know whether anyone who's watching has had this problem, but I've certainly had this problem. I've had allergic reactions to condoms, and I'm sure a lot of other women must have experienced that too, because there are a lot of chemicals that go into some conventional products that shouldn't be in there, that are really irritating for the vagina. Yeah, and I think that it goes back to kind of educating about the different benefits and, and side effects of these kind of treatments. and. And we're very transparent around the ingredients we use and, and like we say, making sure that they are balanced to our bodies. Um, as kind and, you know, as gentle as possible. Exactly, yeah. Um, and then the kit as well, we've also got vitamins to support kind of um, our, our bodies or hormonal cycle. And we worked with a, a nutritionist at uh, Vital Health to really put together this kind of curated um, set of vitamins that we think would be really good around kind of balancing our, our nutrition during coming off hormones. Um, we've got some lovely candy kittens treats in there. What else is in there, Farah? We've remember. got some dame tampons, uh, uh, spot in. Uh, we've got pack of tea for when you've got cramps. Um, it's a really nice bundle that, you know, can help you through this time. Very good for, for balancing your hormones, the, the Parker Ayurvedic tea. Just going back to the condoms, um, one, one question I have for you is your condoms are biodegradable, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. They're, they're biodegradable. Now, what about most condom brands on the market, particularly the ones that seem to be designed for boy racers, you know, in <laughs> lurid red packaging? Are they biodegradable? Or what are they made of? So there's a variety on the market. Some condoms, as you already mentioned, contain lots of chemicals that affect the biodegradability. Um, so we don't use things like burnsides and anaesthetics. Um, wow, and things they, that, some of them contain anaesthetic. Yeah, to make a man last longer off, or, uh, you know, the user with, with a penis to, to last longer because it numbs the end of the penis and that can be irritable for, for some women if it, if it gets into the vagina. Uh, so we don't use those kind of things. We also don't... Um, what about plastic? Is there plastic yeah. condom uh, brands? So non-latex condoms use um, plastic polyisoprene or polyurethane, which basically forms a plastic that obviously don't biodegrade. Right. Well, that's not good news, is it? Um, it's you know, that, that's a major problem for, for landing up, polluting our rivers and seas, along with other ingredients that you don't want landing up in the, the natural world. Was it important for you to, to make a condom that was uh, sustainable and environmentally friendly, Sarah? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, it was. It was um, definitely part of, of what we what we were you know, it was important to us when we were doing the product development. It was on, a, on the list, so it was a non-negotiable. How, um, what's the response been like so far to the, to the Hormone Harmony kit? I know you've only very recently launched it, but did you, did you do some trials with it to see how you got on with it? We actually turned around the product quite quickly. We knew it was something that 
our customers wanted and perhaps other customer people that weren't our customers and during corona it was a great opportunity to knuckle down and create something that would support people who can't get access to hormonal contraceptives and um, so we didn't necessarily have time to trial all the products but we have all test the products in different ways over the years we're big fans of candy kittens you know i use dame tampons so they were brands that are loved by us and we can vouch for uh, but collectively we haven't used them yet i think it's been really popular so we only launched on the friday and we've had considerable success on social media we've had lots of uh, people tweet and do some unboxing online we've actually had quite a lot of um customer service emails around what the vitamins do and um, certainly more detailed questions around the bundle itself which which suggests to us that there is definitely interest but it's not the sort of product that you would pick up like for example a face mask or a cream it's a considered purchase and as Sarah said you know you should seek medical advice if it's something you want to consider um, so we wouldn't expect it to sell out within minutes but we're certainly getting inquiries and we've had we've had a bit of a a dent in the sales already from Friday, which is good. Um, could I could I go back to you, Sarah? I've got a question for you, which is which is about the growing growing trend to towards healthy living. Um, are you seeing a, a, a trend for women wanting to have a hormone free approach to um, contraception? Yes, definitely. I was seeing it a lot in clinics and also with our friends and uh, people around us. You know, we're more aware of what we're putting in and on our bodies. We're, um, you know, the contraception is, is fantastic and it's, it's definitely empowering for us to take control of our fertility and, and plan that. But at the same time, you know, a lot of women are now questioning, do I really want to be putting these hormones in my body for you know years even sometimes over a decade and and actually what is my natural cycle like and how can I be more natural in the ways that I manage it so a hundred percent people are, are looking at more more natural um choices than than synthetic hormones and so are you seeing that on the forum that they're, they're asking you for um a complete holistic approach to contraception yeah definitely um and and you know condoms are the the only the, the best thing for that really you know there are different uh, apps to track our cycles which are great but in terms of actually um an effective form of contraception that has the added benefit of protecting against sdis that i'm know, just going to say i mean for protecting against sdis you know the only way to do that is to also, yeah. um, yeah. ask your partner to wear a condom um I, I want to ask you about your your time working as a gynaecologist and as a doctor at St Thomas's Hospital in London and meeting women in in all sorts of circumstances where maybe they they come to you with an with an SDI with with, with a problem as, as a result of a failure of sexual protection and contraception what, what would you say are the over arching problems that you've seen in clinic where you would like to you know to to give women advice about taking control of their sexual health yeah i mean so when i was in sexual health clinics um and seeing women coming in with with unwanted pregnancies you know it was um it was difficult because you know these are empowered women that are confident in every aspect of their lives but they didn't feel comfortable asking their partner or bringing a condom to the table when they were having sex so it it really did highlight to me that this is a, a problem uh, you know a wide-ranging problem for lots of lots of people and actually there's a taboo around there's a taboo around condoms um, there's a taboo around talking about uh, sexual health and sexual protection but also um, you kind of accessing that and kind of the stigma of going to access, um, you know, abortion services or, or, you know, sexual health services in general. And so it really did make me, th you know, passionate about what we're doing at Hanks and kind of just tackling those taboos head on. It's a really important topic. I, I, have you seen sex education? Yeah, so good. Yeah, I, th I thought the storyline where Maeve, the, the smartest girl, in the school lands up getting pregnant and you don't expect it 
with her because she's so smart and intelligent and if she can get pregnant when she doesn't want to when she seems so in charge um, of her her life then it can happen happen to any of us and you know the, the scene where she goes to the abortion clinic is is very honest yeah it was really good to show that because it can ha happen to anyone and you know did she not feel strong enough to say to the head boy in sex education even though he turns out to be a really nice character yeah. that we need to use a condom yeah exactly yeah the possibility yeah. of pregnancy and we also know that in may's case because she's economically insecure because she comes from a broken family and her dream is to go to university it would be a disaster for her to be pregnant as a teenage girl it's it's a great storyline no it is and it brings up a lot i think sex education is great in that it brings up loads of different topics and different areas that people can relate to um and that's definitely one of them and you know it's not it's definitely uh, circumstantial for whoever it is going through an abortion or having an unwanted pregnancy and, and figuring out how they're going to navigate that um, and the people around them that support them. So I think, yeah, really, really love sex education for that. Well, you know, she didn't have any support, did she? She lands up asking her male friend who has a huge secret crush on her, who happens to be the perfect gentleman to come and collect her and it's a moment of black tragic comedy because he thinks he's on a date and he's collected yeah. secret love from her abortion with someone else it, no, it's yeah. brilliant storytelling what what would you like to say to to women watching this about taking charge of your sexuality so that that never happens to you as a gynecologist and as a doctor? I think it's about being honest with yourself and, and knowing your body. I mentioned it before, kind of owning that, like whatever you do with your body is it's yours and actually you have to own that journey and things will change and adapt along the way. But but own that and if, you know if you want if you want to have sex with somebody and they're fobbing you off about a condom, you have to stand up to that person, don't you? And not exactly yeah. Stand Not, up for uh, put yourself at risk. Yeah. And you know, own your sexuality, own your body, but also support yourself with, with the right tools and, and people and whatever other education you can gain access to because that ultimately will will, will support your journey too. Uh, sorry, this is a non gynecologist view, but it's one of two things. You don't carry a condom or you don't use one. You'll either end up pregnant or with an STI and do you want either of those right now in your life, depending on what age you are or what your choices are? Probably not. So it's quite black and white uh, in terms of using a condom or not. Yeah, it is about feeling empowered to do that and to stand your ground. But I'm sure we've all been in a situation where a man has said, oh, you don't need to. You know, I don't have a problem. And you have to be adamant. You have to be really firm about it or maybe choose not to have sex with that person. Yeah, it's like Farah said, either, do, you know, don't have sex, it's either use it or get one of those things that you don't want. So it's, it's that choice. Can I ask you, what are, what are your dreams and goals for Hanks in, in the coming years? Where, where do you want to take your female empowered company, your disruptive sexual health company? I'll let you start on that one. So, I mean, for me, the ultimate vision is that women, mothers, sisters, daughters all go to Hanks as a, as a place um, to get their knowledge and their insight and products that they need to take control of their health, their female health. And I think in terms of the actual company, we want to build and create products all the way from a woman's first time having sex to her first child in order to be products around that. So we want to be able to support that female ecosystem. And, and I think completely, uh, obviously, on board with what Sparrow's just said. And I think also important to mention, you know, yeah, we've, we've started with, with uh, focusing on women because that's who we are. Um, we're very inclusive. You know, we have lots of male, um, you know, gender neutral people. Like there's people of all genders that are uh, invested in Hanks and, and part of that community. So I think that's really important to say as well. Also, you know, if we want to change the conversation and 
help people to be more open about sex and sex education. It's about people coming together, isn't it? It's both genders yeah. talking to each other and uh, removing the taboos and stigmas and hopefully dramas like Sex Education and um, Ladies in Black, which I've just been watching on, on Netflix, which is fascinating because it's set in the 50s, which was even uh, an even more taboo era. And there's an excruciatingly heartbreaking scene where this woman goes to the doctor for um, a checkup and she's very embarrassed to talk about sex and she isn't really having sex with her, with her husband. And it turns out that he's ashamed to actually desire his wife. Wow. And it's all sorted out by a beautiful piece of, of lingerie and actually talking to one another. <laughs> yeah, it all comes down to communication. That's like, it's always, always the thing. Fantastic. I, I would love to read this quote out, which I found about, um, from Marilyn Monroe, who I think was often misunderstood. She, you know, she was a very intelligent, beautiful woman who was not afraid to own her sexuality. And she said, we are all born sexual creatures, thank God, but it's a pity so many despise and crush this natural gift. So uh, true. I just thought that was a really, really beautiful way to talk about your sexuality and your femininity. Um, right, now we um, have got two kits, two Hanks Hormone Harmony kits to, to give away. Um, do we have winners, Charlotte? We do indeed. So I've used a random generator on the internet. Fantastic. And we have uh, a very lucky Gemma Sawyer, I believe, taking notes all the time. We saw you. <laughs> so we have a Gemma Sawyer who's won a Hormone Harmony kit. And well, the next Gemma. person is an Amy Durrant, also a winner. So we'll be emailing you after this. Okay, ladies. <laughs> now, we want to uh, throw the interview open for questions. Uh, would, would anybody like to be brave enough to, to ask a question? Well, we've got two in the chat, if you want me to read those out for you. Yes, fantastic, thank you. Sure. So we have Sue who asks, I'm interested in how social distancing will change our behavior. Will we need to relearn intimacy? Very good question. Who would Very like good. to answer that? Sarah I, I don't mind having a few comments and you can add as well, Sarah. Um, I think it's a really interesting one, Sue, because I've been thinking about exactly the same thing and we've discussed it a lot um, in how, you know, we, a lot of people may be isolating alone and actually people who are dating, we've also been discussing, you know, how, is dating going to change? And I do think that social intimacy will change, especially in the kind of nearer future. You know, we're not going to be shaking hands with people, never mind getting more sexually intimate. And I think maybe um, kind of becoming more intimate, especially with a new person, will take a bit longer um, in the initial stages. As humans, we crave touch, we crave being around other people. So I definitely don't think that it'll, it'll change dramatically in that sense. But I think that when we first meet people, I think the way that we interact will be different. And therefore, with, with new partners, it probably will be slightly more reserved in the earlier stages um but i still think that yeah we were not like natural creatures that want to to be intimate with each other yeah i'd i'd agree with what sarah says and actually there's a few thoughts i've got so i think certainly people in relationships and in lockdown together will go one of two ways they'll either use this opportunity to explore and get to know their partner or they'll be calling up their local divorce lawyer and figuring out how to get out of it asap <laughs> Um, and then I also think um, in terms of intimacy for new for single people, um, Sarah's right, it's going to be a bit difficult to get to know someone when you can't have that touch or that contact. But equally, if nowhere is open, such as restaurants and cinemas, then the only thing you can do is either virtually have a conversation, and eventually meet face to face in one room, which will probably end up being one or the other person's house and could probably end up in sex who knows <laughs> it's anyone's game <laughs> it, and then maybe who knows in a, in a distant future people might even suggest that you get tested before you meet your date as yeah in, exactly yeah 
um, and then we're in a whole era that was in the 80s and getting tattoos. So like, it's just a yeah. funny old world we live in, isn't it? It really um, is. Okay. I hope that answers your question, Sue. I think it did. I think it did. Um, we also have another question while I'm here from an Emily. Um, and she says, what percentage of your customers are male identifying versus female identifying? Interested to see if the female empowered messaging is appealing beyond that market. Um, so that's a very interesting question. Thank you, Emily. We have around 70% of our consumers are women and 30% are men, but we've actually seen as a team in the last few months that the proportion of males purchasing condoms has actually increased. I think last month we were at 40% male, 60% female. Um, so a real mix is starting to balance out. And I think often the sort of feedback we get from men is, oh, well, I'm getting brownie points from you know from my girlfriend because this is an empowered condom and it's ethical and um and I think women's men stand for that as well and also we've heard men sort of say I don't want a garish bright red foil in my pocket like I want something discreet that people aren't going to notice yeah definitely it definitely um I think and I hope that Hanks appeals to all genders you know whatever you identify as or you know um whatever whoever your partner is I think it's you know the things we stand for are being open and honest about sexuality. We're, you know, we want people to own that. We want to educate, inform, open the conversation. And um, yeah, I think it's a bit of a misconception that because we're, you know, we're two female founders and we're, you know, that's a, a market that's not really, really been spoken to before. Um, it doesn't mean that our, our kind of community is exclusively women. I will bring the interview to a close by saying, uh, do have a look at Ethical Head Nurse. So it's an organic social enterprise, um, arts, entertainment, food and fashion magazine based on, very much inspired by my time at the Times newspaper as a feature writer and fashion editor. And um, we'd love, yeah, we'd love to see you reading the magazine. We're also crowdfunding at the moment. Have a look at everything we're doing. The next chat show interview is going to be with uh, an academic who has written a fascinating book about the life of trees. So I will be posting information about that. And I'm also probably going to team up with Good 60 to be talking about how we can protect and champion the artisan producers, small food companies, uh, farmers markets who really really need us now it, it's an important time to be shopping more and local and obviously cooking from scratch which is a, a big topic on ethical headness so lots of recipes um, lots of reviews of um, hit dramas so I hope you enjoy it all and I hope you've really enjoyed our first live chat show interview thank you very much and thank you very much to Hanks, to Sarah, Farah, and Charlotte. Thank you for having us. In thank our, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for joining everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.